name. Glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name. Come to this fountain so rich and sweet. Cast thy poor soul at the Savior's feet. Plunge in today and be made complete. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood of life. Glory to his name. Turn over to page 131. 131. Dear Lord, we're just so thankful to be in your house tonight, God. We just thank you, Lord, for being so good to us. Thank you, Lord, for the service today and the word we heard. God, we just thank you, Lord, for each one. And those that are sick, Lord, tonight that can't be with us and those are shut in, God, we pray that you be with them. Give them strength and help. Help us to be a witness this week. We love you and praise you. Bless the remainder of the service. Amen. 131. Sing it out now. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, early in the morning our song shall rise. Well, thank you so much for being with us tonight. Appreciate you being. There we go. Appreciate you being in the house of God's blessing to see you. Those that are joining us via the live stream, thank you as well. Appreciate you being uh, in the service with us tonight. Uh, got many, many announcements as we told you this morning. Just a lot of different things going on. But especially, don't forget, this coming Wednesday night, for the next three Wednesday nights, Brother Don McCann uh, is going to be with us. He's going to be teaching and preaching on prayer, uh, and just really looking forward to that. But that starts this Wednesday night, same time as usual, 6.30. Uh, but uh, just be much in prayer for him. God will give him the strength and the health that he needs uh, to be able to be with us. Just really excited uh, about being in services with him. The Widow's Support Meeting, Thursday, October 13th uh, at 1 o'clock. Uh, Zachary Steakhouse in Colonial Heights. Well, they'll be going there. Uh, please see Sister Geneva for further details. 
And then also feel free to invite a widowed friend. Business meeting. We talked about this uh, this coming Sunday, not Sunday night, not obviously tonight, but next Sunday night. Uh, we'll be kind of having a mid-year budget and review. Just kind of show you kind of where we're at against the budget, how things are going, some of the things that we've done. Uh, some of the things we're very well aware of, especially the ladies uh, with the update to the ladies restroom back here and then we just finished up or I say we <laughs> brother Jim and brother Dennis and who all ever, ever else has been working on them uh, another one of them just got finished and so there's a lot of things going on so we want to kind of share with you a little bit of that kind of stuff and and also kind of share with you what our thought processes are kind of about things going forward uh, we're trying to be uh, wise stewards at the same time realizing uh, that we've got to keep ministry, and so we're you know we're trying to balance all of those things in a recession economy and look at all that. So we want to kind of let you see what the idea is or what the thought process is for how we're looking at some of this stuff. Uh, and so, like I said, just come next week. Uh, we'll probably just sing one or two like we did tonight, and then just get right into it uh, and and let you see kind of what's going on. Uh, the Wilds Couples Retreats October 14th through the 16th. Uh, Check-ins from five to seven with supper and program beginning at 7:30. Uh, your balance can be paid online or at check-in. See uh, Brother Tim, Sister Lisa, if you got any questions. Uh, the youth group outing next Sunday, October 16th, after the morning service. Uh, the destination there is Stickley Farms. Uh, pizza in the youth room before the departure. There's no charge. Bring you a change of clothes and tennis shoes. Please see Sister Whitney if you got any questions in regards to that. Uh, senior adult meeting, Monday, October 17th, 6 o'clock in the banquet hall. Uh, bring your favorite covered dish and salad topping. Uh, the salad base and the drinks uh, will be provided. The sign-up's in the foyer. Speaker will be Tom Patton from the Kingsport Police Department. Uh, the fellowship meal beginning on, uh, we'll start those back up on October 19th, so not this Wednesday, but next uh, at 5 o'clock. We'll be starting our fellowship meals back up. Uh, just looking forward to that, being able to spend some time just uh, relaxing with each other before we come over to the services. Uh, that'll work out good, too. Hopefully, Brother Donald and uh, his dear wife will be able to uh, join us as well for at least some of those. Um, and then uh, the craft fair, Saturday, October 22nd from 8 to 4, uh, accepting monetary donations to purchase the breakfast and lunch supplies. Uh, if you're interested in helping with that part of it, see Brother Bill Farmer. Also, we're going to be selling baked goods. Uh, and if you're going to put those, we'll just do two to a bag. Um, and uh, the sign-up sheet for all of that's in the foyer as well. Trunk or, uh, the Trunk or Treat, Saturday, October 29th from 3 to 5. We're accepting candy donations, and the box for that's in the foyer. If you're interested in helping with that, please see Sister Bethany. And then Night in Bethlehem, uh, the sign-up's in the foyer there as well. Uh, and as we told you, what that's, it's basically you go through different stations or different tents of different uh, uh, vocations and those kind of things that would have been prevalent in Bethlehem during the time of Christ. The last tent uh, will uh, take you through the actual Christmas story. We're using this as an outreach event into the community, so it'll be on the 18th uh, starting that afternoon. And then there's different, as people just come in, they can go through the different stations. There'll be crafts for the kids to do. There's a lot of different things kind of going on. Uh, so if you've got any questions about that, again, sign-up sheets in the foyer. But if you've got particular questions, uh, you can um, talk to Sister Wendy. Uh, or Brother Reggie and Sister Christy as they're all kind of coordinating this, getting there to all put together. Uh, but looking forward to that as an outreach uh, during the Christmas season. I think that'll be just a blessing and a big help. Any other announcements uh, that I'm forgetting? Any announcements I'm forgetting? Don't forget, after the service tonight, we will be having prayer time. Uh, so those of you on the live stream, as always, uh, we'll go away for just a second and then come right back. Uh, and on the private side of the live stream, we'll be sharing prayer requests to let everybody know of what to be praying for and to hear the answers to prayer that God has already provided. Uh, and uh, so just be much in prayer uh, that God would just have his way uh, in all of those. I'll update you there as well about what's going on with my brother and the loss of his son. Uh, we'll talk more about that. And I can kind of give you a little, a, 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 what little bit more I know, I can tell you kind of what's happening then. Uh, but just continue to remember my brother and his family, all right? You have your Bibles. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter number 6. Isaiah chapter number 6, one of my favorite passages uh, in all of the Old Testament uh, we find here. Uh, and I am just uh, excited about this particular topic. I'll tell you now, and you can thank me later, uh, but as I was studying, 
uh, for this message, I, 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 I originally sent Sister Tammy three bullet points. Uh, and uh, so this is kind of where we're going and all of these kind of things. So that way she can go ahead and get the bulletin stuff ready. And I got to studying, and I was three pages in with my notes and hadn't hit the first point yet. And I thought, that's not going to work. <laughs> so we're going to do two tonight, and then we'll do the last one next week uh, and because it actually can be divided into two parts. So we'll do two this week and two next week. That way I won't keep you here. Uh, until you get too tired to sit and listen. Uh, but Isaiah chapter number 6, verses 1 through 8, we read this incredible passage of Scripture. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and His train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts." Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and whom will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. Father, I ask now that you just hide me behind the cross of Calvary tonight. Father, I pray that you would clear my mind, allow me to focus on what you would have said here tonight. Father, I pray that the Holy Spirit of God would touch in my heart, first of all, again afresh, even after the touch this past week, and I pray that as I share the truths that you've burdened my heart with, that it will be as one who has already been touched to a group of people that I know you want to touch. So, Father, have your way. We'll give you the praise and glory for all that you do. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, like I said, probably one of the most awe-inspiring chapters of the Bible is this particular one that we read here. Years ago, uh, as I was meditating on this passage of Scripture, oddly enough, I was on my riding lawnmower. Uh, I tell people all the time that that's one of my favorite places to think about Scripture because it's basically just road work. I can drive in a circle or drive in a four-point square without having to, to focus and concentrate too much on that. And I can just let my mind wander and I can pray and just kind of concentrate. And I was on the mower and, and I was thinking about this particular passage of Scripture, meditating on it, and, and, and God spoke to my heart about what we see here in such a way that Still to this day, it touches me and encourages my heart, especially when I find myself asking the question, what am I going to do now? If you look at this passage, you'll see that Isaiah was concerned because King Uzziah, one of the rare good kings of God's people, had died. Both he and all of the nation were concerned about what they were going to do now that good King Uzziah had died. And God revealed himself to Isaiah in a way that not only quieted the fears in Isaiah's mind, but showed Isaiah a glimpse of the majesty and the holiness of God. And as part of that uh, came a fresh commissioning to Isaiah for the office of prophet. You ever ask yourself the question, when you read this passage, why, does it, why did Isaiah make the statement, I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips? I mean, the Bible tells us in the New Testament that uh, it's from the heart that the man speaks, or that a man speaks. So why doesn't it say, I am a man of an unclean heart, or, and I dwell amongst the people of an unclean heart? Because that would have been just as true. But instead, it specifically says, I am a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. And I'm riding around on my little mower 
and praying and asking God to show me what's going on here, and it finally clicked. What happens? And let's just go back, and we can talk about times in our own history here in the United States, the assassination of John F. Kennedy. What happened? What was going on? People were, you know, what are we going to do? The president's dead. How are we going to, you know, what, you know, what, you know, we're right in the midst, middle of all of this stuff with Russia and Cuba, and you know, what are we going to do? He was a good president. What are we going to do now that the president's dead? Can't you imagine that Isaiah and the rest of the nation of Israel saying the same thing? What are we going to do? Good King Uzziah is dead. Almost all of the kings that we've had have been bad kings. How are we going to, you know, how are we going to get another good king? Like good King Uzziah. What are we going to do? The king is dead. And then this is what we read. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Isaiah sees this image of God and he realizes the king ain't dead. Long live the king. He's still on the throne. And he realizes, and that's why he says, I am a man of unclean lips and I dwell among a people of unclean lips. Isaiah had been just as guilty of saying, what are we going to do? The king is dead. God says, I'm right here. What are you talking about? And he says, I'm a man of unclean lips. And he has to be purged from the sin. I don't know about you, but every time I get it down in that what am I going to do stage, I go back to that passage of Scripture and I realize God's still on the throne. I don't have to worry about it. But as you look at this passage, again, the central or the centerpiece of this passage is what Isaiah says, or what the seraphim say to Isaiah. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, the whole earth, is full of his glory. And of course, Isaiah's rightful response to that kind of a vision and such a declaration was that he falls on his knees before God. In the New Testament, we see a similar response of the Apostle John when he sees the glorified Christ in Revelation chapter number 1, starting in verse 12. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks and in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace. And his voice is the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. And his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And listen to verse 17. And when I saw him, I fell as dead, as dead at his feet. Every part of the description of Christ here highlights his holiness. The head and hair of white and the eyes as a flame of fire and his feet like hot glowing brass and a voice of raging water. In both of these cases, when these men were presented with the holiness of God, they fell at his feet, stunned, ashamed, as a dead man, and with holy fear. I sometimes wonder what God thinks when we come to his house to worship him today. And we come with very little, if any, consciousness of who it is we stand before. For many, worship is more about the people that are there than the God we should be coming to honor. Isaiah and John would be appalled. And I'm sure that God's heartbroken at our lack of awareness. But as we tackle this attribute that our God is holy, we immediately become or come up on this great problem. What is it? Even with a physical revelation of God, like we see in Isaiah and we see in the book of the Revelation, we cannot really comprehend what it means that our God is holy. A.W. Tozer said this, We cannot grasp the true meaning of the divine holiness. Now listen, we cannot grasp the true meaning of the divine holiness by thinking of someone or something very pure, 
and then raising the concept to the highest degree we are capable of. God's holiness is not simply the best we know, infinitely bettered. We know nothing like the divine holiness. It stands apart, unique, unapproachable, incomprehensible, and unattainable. The natural man is blind to it. He may fear God's power and admire His wisdom, but His holiness he cannot even imagine. Holy, he says, is the way God is. Now you listen really closely to the next two sentences. To be holy, he does not conform to a standard. He is that standard. That ought to shake us to our boots. He is absolutely holy with an infinite, incomprehensible fullness of purity that is incapable of being other than it is. Those words, like I said, we should, it would do us well to contemplate those words on a regular basis. So the task of trying to describe or define God's holiness is difficult to say the least. Now, if you look up the Hebrew and the Greek words for holy or holiness, you'll see that it, it basically at its core means that ultimately God is completely different in kind and He is separate from everything else that He's created. He is holy, He is different, He is unique in kind because He's the creator and everything else is the creation. Now, in the last message, we talked about the difference between God's holiness and God's goodness. And we said there about holiness that when we speak of God being holy, we're acknowledging that God is different and separate from all that He's created. In 1 Samuel chapter 2, and verse number 2, it says, There is none holy as the Lord. And if you'll go back and look, that word as there means like. There is none holy in the same way or like the Lord. For there is none beside thee. There is nothing to compare him to. So he is completely holy from that standpoint. He's different in kind than everything else he's created. Is there any rock, it says, like our God? Holiness also speaks to God's absolute moral purity, as we've said. In Habakkuk chapter number 1, verse number three or 13, Habakkuk speaks about God's holiness and his inability to tolerate sin. When he says, thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil and canst not look on iniquity. Charles Ryrie in his basic theology says, in respect to God, holiness holiness means not only that he is separate from all that is unclean and evil, but also that he is positively pure and thus distinct from all others. And the scripture makes it clear that there's a connection between recognizing God's holiness and worshiping Him. Psalm 99 says this, starting in verse number 1. The Lord reigneth, let the people tremble. He sitteth between the cherubims, let the earth be moved. The Lord is great in Zion, and He is high above all the people. Here it is, verse number 3. Let them praise thy great and terrible name, for it is holy. So first off, God's name is holy. The king's strength also loveth judgment. Thou dost, thou dost, thou dost establish iniqu- or equity. Thou executest judgment and righteousness in Jacob. Here it is. Exalt ye the Lord our God and worship at his footstool, for he is holy. Moses and Aaron among his priests and Samuel among them that called upon his name. They called upon the Lord and he answered them. He spake unto them in the cloudy pillar. They kept his testimonies and the ordinance that he gave them. Thou answerest them, O Lord our God, thou wast a God that forgavest them, thou that tookest vengeance of their inventions. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy hill, for the Lord our God is holy. Three times in nine verses, the Bible tells us that God is holy and that that holiness 
says that it, it, that it should invoke in us a sense of worship. And in the New Testament, we see the worship of God and His holiness. And again, in the book of the Revelation, as part of the song of Moses, where it speaks of the Old Testament saints, of the song of Moses and of the Lamb, which speaks of the New Testament saints. Listen to Revelation chapter 15, starting in verse number 3. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy. For all nations shall come and worship before thee. For thy judgments are made manifest. So we can see when it talks about the holiness of God, that there's a definitely, because of that holiness, there's a reason to worship Him. But the question becomes, how does the fact that God is holy, how does that actually impact our worship? Well, notice with me, first of all, that God's holiness makes us sensitive to His perfections. God's holiness makes us sensitive to His perfections. After Moses and the children of Israel passed through the Red Sea and God had destroyed Pharaoh and his army, the people sang a song of worship and deliverance. And in Exodus chapter 15 and verse number 11, the Bible says, Who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like thee, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? God's holiness is so powerful a description of who God is that the Bible tells us in Psalm 119 or 111 in verse number 9, He sent redemption unto His people. He hath commanded His covenant forever. Again, here it is. Holy and reverend is His name. Holy and to be revered is His name. As I was reading and studying and just trying to get everything I could that I could find on the holiness of God, I came across this quote from John MacArthur that really made me stop and think. Now, you listen to this. When they exalted God, the angels didn't say, eternal, eternal, eternal. They didn't say, faithful, faithful, faithful. Wise, wise, wise. Or mighty, mighty, mighty. They said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty. Revelation chapter 4 and verse number 8. And yet, let's be honest. That's the one attribute of God that we don't like to necessarily dwell on. We love to speak of God's goodness and His faithfulness and His love and His mercy and His grace. But when it comes to His holiness, we hesitate. Why? Because it does two things. First off, it highlights His perfection. But it also reminds us of just how imperfect we are. And because of that, we shy away from spending too much time thinking or talking about how His holiness shows just how undeserving we really are. And that brings us to the next point, which is God's holiness makes us aware of our sinfulness. Go back to Isaiah's response when he saw the Lord sitting on the throne and he heard the cry of the angels when they cried out, Holy, holy, holy. What was his response? Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone. Because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. When Isaiah got a look at the whole, just a little bit of the holiness of God, it sure changed his perspective on himself, didn't it? When Peter saw the miracle of the fishes in the net, he was overwhelmed by the fact that he stood in the presence of someone that was more than just a man, but who was also God. And he cried out in Luke chapter number 5 and verse number 8, When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, 
for I am a sinful man, O Lord. The holiness of God drives home just how desperately sinful mankind is. We read the familiar words of Romans chapter number 3, verses 10 through 8, and it paints this hopeless picture as it is written, There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and mystery or misery are in their ways. And the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. That's what a glimpse of God's holiness should cause us to realize. Because of sin, there's a chasm between God and sinful man. As Isaiah 59 and verse number 2 says, But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid His face from you that He will not hear. God's holiness will not allow Him to tolerate sin. So the question is, what has to be done? How can a holy God extend forgiveness without violating his holiness and the answer is the death of the Lord Jesus Christ for our sins because we don't like to dwell on the holiness of God I fear that we miss out on our understanding or on understanding a key element of Christ's sacrifice for our sins we have to realize that because God is holy sinful man is more than just separated from God. That separation, the Bible tells us, is one of enmity, where there's an animosity towards an enemy. Sinful man is an enemy of God. James chapter number 4 and verse number 4 says, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. And it, it isn't just that there's a distance between God and sinful man. How many of you have seen the artwork? And I'm not saying it's a bad depiction, but how many of you have seen the artwork where there's like a cliff over here and a cliff over here, and then there's this big chasm, and they've got the person over here and God over here. How am I going to get from here to here, right? We've seen that. Okay, but it's more than just a distance. We have to understand that God is rightfully and fully offended by the sinfulness of mankind. I've been struggling with this. God just kind of burdened my heart with this right before the service started. Go with me. Give me just a second. Go with me to Revelation, I think it's chapter 15. Revelation chapter number 15. That may not be it. Give me just a second. Oh, it's in here somewhere. No. Uh, what I'm looking for is where it talks about the smoke of their burning uh, coming up before God continually. And, yeah, and I know it's right in this, maybe it's 13. Let me make 1411, is that it? Let's see. Yes, here, thank you. All right. Now, listen to this. Starting in verse number 9. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, 
which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. They have no rest day nor night who worship the beast in his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Now, if you go over to Revelation, just a, couple, just a little bit over to chapter number 20. And when the thousand years, verse number 7, and when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast into that lake of fire and brimstone. So here's the same connection. Uh, where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man, according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death, and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And obviously the context there is, is that they too will suffer punishment for eternity. Now have you ever asked yourself the question or had somebody either in a critical way or in a questioning way ask yourself the question, why would a, why would a good, holy, or a good and loving God punish somebody for an eternity for sins they committed over 80 years or 70 years or 30 years or 40 years. Why are they punished for eternity if they only sinned for a handful of years? The answer is the holiness of God. Sin. A single sin is so offensive to the nature and the holiness of God that an eternity of punishment is the only right response to that offense. So we have to understand that it is the holiness of God and the sinfulness of man that creates the, this lake of fire where people are judged for eternity. That's how much the holiness of God is a part of who he is. God's holiness is rightfully and fully offended by the sin of mankind. To offend an infinite and holy God, an infinitely holy God is to bring on an, inf an infinite and eternal wrath. But here's the problem. Man on his own can be nothing but a sinner because of the sin nature that's a part of every man. We can't approach God with anything to offer Him of ourselves because the Bible tells us in Isaiah 64 and verse number 6, but we are all as an unclean thing and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. And we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. What this tells us is that on our own merit, even if we were to live the absolute best life we could live, when compared to the holiness of God, and remember, God is the standard of holiness. If, when compared to the holiness of God, our righteous acts are nothing but filth before God. So on our own, we have no access to a holy God because our sinfulness prevents that kind of an entry. So in some way, man's approach to God has to come through a different means. It couldn't come from us. So it had to come from God. But because God's holy, he couldn't just say, I forgive you. 
without him violating his own holiness. Since our own merit can't get us there, we have to rely on the merit of another. So to satisfy God's holiness, as well as his righteousness, and as well as his justice, God made a way that we could be redeemed, saved, and brought back into fellowship with him. To satisfy God's holy demand of a perfect life, God himself took on human flesh in the person of Jesus Christ, and he lived the holy life that God required. And as Romans chapter number 5, verses 1 and 2 says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace, wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. We have to realize that God's holiness is the reason that Christ had to die for our sins. His, his death on our behalf was what the Bible calls the propitiation for us. 1 John chapter number 2, verse number 2. And He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Christ died to pay the penalty of sin. And the word propitiation means that Christ's sacrifice, His death for our sins, is what put us in a position to where we could be saved. Without the death of Christ to satisfy the holiness of God, there is no way that we could be saved. His death satisfied the demands of a holy God that sin be punished. But God's love, working in concert with His holiness. Remember I said, no, no attribute works in opposition to the other. They all work together. God's love, working in concert and in cooperation with His holiness, provided the way that we could be saved, even though we were sinners. One commentator said this, God's holiness is His majestic purity that cannot tolerate moral evil. God's love is his outgoing, tender-hearted embrace of the sinner. God's holiness is his separateness from what is unclean and profane. God's love is his willingness to identify with those who are in unclean in order to help them. His holiness cannot be violated without just retribution. But the good news is that God in his infinite love has taken the retribution that we deserve upon himself in the life and death of his son, Jesus Christ. Now you listen to this, and if this don't put you on worshiping ground, there's nothing going to. You listen close. He turns his wrath upon himself in order to save a lost and fallen human race. He couldn't violate his holiness. So he suffered his own wrath in the person of his son so that we could be saved. The cross of Christ signifies the vindication of his holiness as well as the incommensurability or the vastness of his love. As Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 8 says, For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He turns his wrath upon himself in order to save a lost and fallen human race. So a proper view of God's holiness leads to a proper view of God's perfection 
and also the awfulness of sin and our own awful sinfulness. Just like John, just like Isaiah, we should fall before God and cry, Woe is me when we realize just how sinful we are. But we also should be crying out, Woe is me because of the price it took for us to be saved. But then that cry of woe <laughs> should lead to a heartfelt worship by the saint. Because what God's holiness demanded, God's love supplied. Christ lived the life we couldn't live so that he could die the death we couldn't die. And for that reason, we should worship in sincere thanks that a holy God would pay the price that he demanded so that we could experience his love and be made free. Father, I've shared what you'd have me to share tonight. And over and over again, these words have rung through my mind since I studied. He turns his wrath upon himself in order to save a lost and fallen human race. Because of your holiness, a price had to be saved or had to be paid. But because of your love, you paid the price so that you could both be holy and exhibit your love. And that ought to make us fall on our knees as Isaiah, as John, and as the seraphim and the angels cry, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. And we should thank you that even because of your holiness, you sent your son to die so that we could be saved. We thank you. We love you. We ask it all in the sweet and precious name of Jesus. Amen. All hearts and minds clear. Maybe you just want to brag on Jesus for a moment. Brag on the Lord. All hearts and minds clear. And don't forget this Wednesday night, Brother Don McCann, six thirty, will be with us in the service. Excited about that. Uh, you just pray that God will use him. I know he'll be a blessing. He always is. He'll he'll wear you out sometimes, but he's a blessing. <laughs> as far as he, I mean, he, he don't he don't pull no punches. And uh, but now uh, he'll he'll bless your heart. You come expecting God to do something great for us on Wednesday night, all right? All hearts and minds clear. Those on live stream that are on the private side, hang on. We'll be right back for prayer time. God bless you. Thank you for being with us.